See if everybody made it back from upstairs. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. As you know, um, Vice Admiral Albert T. Church, uh, the director of the Navy, Navy staff, just completed uh, uh, testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee on the review of DOD detention operations and detainee interrogation techniques, known more widely as the Church Report. He's here to share his uh, thoughts with you today about this very comprehensive uh, body of work that he's done. Uh, additionally, today, uh, we have a number of other department uh, and Army officials that are joining him that are going to address some of the many reforms that we've made in detention operations, uh, as well as the importance of interrogations in the global war on terror. Joining him will be uh, Mr. Matthew Waxman, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs. Colonel Pete Champagne, who is the Deputy Provost Marshal for the Army. And Mr. Tom Gandy, who is the Senior Human Intelligence Officer for the Army's Military Intelligence Staff. They will talk to you um, about the uh, action plans for the recommendations that have been made out of uh, the many investigative works that have been done over the uh, many months uh, and the various lines of inquiry that the department has undertaken uh, since these abuses uh, came to light. We will start with Admiral Church. We will have uh, our other officials um, make a brief statement to you also, and then we will go to our questions. With that, Admiral Church. Thank you. Thank you. About the uh Ten months ago, the Secretary of Defense uh, tasked me with some uh, very specific things. First, uh, to review the interrogation techniques, all the interrogation techniques who were considered authorized, employed, or prohibited uh, throughout the global war on terror, uh, to document uh, those techniques uh, in terms of migration, what had migrated and where, uh, to review DOD support to or participation in the activities of non-DOD agencies. Uh, to work closely with and support the independent panel uh, chaired by the Honorable James Schlesinger, which we uh, did and worked very closely with. Implicit in that tasking was to determine whether and if so, to what extent the nature and migration of interrogation techniques contributed to the detainee abuse. And during the course of the investigation, our, our scope expanded and we looked at a number of other issues. Uh, involving ICRC, uh, medical uh, contract interrogators, and others. I believe this investigation was thorough and was exhaustive. We conducted over 800 interviews, the majority of which resulted in sworn statements. Interviews or uh, written statements uh, were taken from senior civilian and military leaders in the Pentagon. We reviewed several thousands of pages of documents. Uh, we did leverage uh, all the other uh, ongoing or completed investigations, excuse me. We carefully analyzed the 70 cases of uh, detainee abuse that had been completed as of 30 September last year, and that effort was to determine was there any impact of the uh, uh, authorized interrogation techniques. Lest I uh, not emphasize it, I want to give you just a few points and backdrop that in the process of this investigation, it became very clear to me and to my team that the importance of intelligence on the global war on terror and the importance of human intelligence as a subset of that. It's been said many times, but I'll emphasize again, the overwhelming majority of our service members have served honorably under extremely difficult and dangerous conditions. And finally, the vast majority of detainees have been treated humanely and appropriately, and in those few instances where they weren't, it's been investigated. My key findings? There was no policy, 
that condoned or authorized either abuse or torture. There was no linkage between the authorized interrogation techniques and the abuses that in fact occurred. We did identify some problems with the, uh, the development, promulgation, dissemination of interrogation techniques, uh, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we did uh, note a uh, lack of field level guidance for the interaction of DOD and CIA personnel. Uh, that again, consistent with uh, some previous reports. We also, with the benefit of hindsight, identified a couple of missed opportunities. First of those being the lessons of previous conflicts were never clearly communicated to the, uh, to the field, picking the risk in dealing with uh, detainees and no specific guidance on interrogation techniques were given to the, uh, to the theater in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we think that would have been beneficial. A couple other points of the 70 closed cases as of 30 September 2004, six were deaths, 26 were what we called serious abuse, and 38 were what we classified as minor abuse. There's several different breakdowns of these abuse cases. Uh, we note that a third of these occurred at the point of capture, and we also note that 20 in the, in the expanded uh, definition of interrogation related could in any way even be considered to be related to interrogation. And again, none of those led to the abuse that we've all, all seen. Uh, we were aware of the uh, FBI document of uh, July last year that talked about uh, instances at uh, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, two of those instances had been investigated, and the third uh, <clears throat> was under investigation as soon as uh, that memo was received by the Army Criminal Investigation Division. Uh, I know there's two investigations ongoing, by uh, uh, one by Southcom and uh, one by the current Naval Inspector General looking at all these documents. Uh, and I'd be happy to entertain questions if you have, uh, have any on that later. I think we're going to go come back to questions if I understand the format. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matthew Waxman, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs. Uh, my office, the Office of Detainee Affairs, was created in July of last year uh, to advise the Secretary on detention policy and strategy and to serve as the focal point for detainee matters within the Department. Uh, Admiral Church has, has briefed you on his investigation findings, uh, and I'd now like to just say a, a, a few words about what the Department has been doing to improve detention operations. U.S. forces will continue to wage the war on terrorism aggressively, uh, including capturing, detaining, and interrogating enemy fighters. Uh, that said, we are also committed uh, to the humane treatment of all individuals in our custody. These two objectives, effective and aggressive pursuit of terrorists, and the humane treatment of detainees are not mutually exclusive, they're mutually reinforcing. Altogether, the 10 major reviews, assessments, and investigations undertaken by DOD have produced over 400 specific recommendations uh, for improving detention operations, many of which DOD has, has already implemented. Uh, we recognize that policy, doctrine, and organization must change, and that we, excuse me, that we require tactics, techniques, and procedures that are effective in the current operational environment. We have a process in place to formally address every recommendation of each major report, investigation, or inspection. Uh, and this process involves not only the Office of the Secretary of Defense, but the Joint Staff, the Combatant Commands, the Military Services, uh, as well as the intelligence community and the legal community. Admiral Church's uh, report recommendations will be incorporated into that process. And uh, among the many fixes DOD has uh, already implemented are to name just a, a few uh, improvements to doctrine and training, which my, my Army colleagues can speak to. Uh, the combatant commands have improved facilities and procedures in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo. Uh, and DOD has instituted new procedures for handling reports from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, as I say, Admiral Church's findings will be extremely useful as we continue this process of improvement. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon, and, uh, and thank you for your interest in this story. My name is uh, Colonel Peter Champagne. I'm the uh, Deputy Provost Marshal General uh, on the Army staff. The, the Provost Marshal General is the action agent on the Army staff uh, for the Secretary of the Army, who's the, uh, the DOD Executive Agent for Detainee Operations Policy. Uh, I note that some of you uh, in the audience today uh, were also at the hearing, and, and I'd just like to start off my remarks by, uh, by just uh, noting that one of the senators today said uh, you need to put this issue in proper context. Uh, when you consider the fact that uh, we've had about a million servicemen deployed uh, over the last couple of years uh, in the global war on terrorism, and there's only been about 300 cases of uh, detainee abuse, um, and we've handled over 70,000 detainees. That, that equates, if you do the math, to, uh, to less than one-tenth of one percent. Of course, the Department doesn't condone uh, any incident of abuse, and we're aggressively pursuing any allegation of abuse. Uh, one thing to note, I think, is that uh, the focus on the abuse really does overshadow uh, the efforts that, that these servicemen uh, and women uh, are performing on a daily basis. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, in, in the global war on terrorism, uh, they continue to serve with honor and distinction. And, and, and the servicemen and women who uh, committed some of these abuses is certainly not characteristic of the great majority of them that, that, that serve with distinction and honor every day uh, in the cause of freedom. And, and more importantly, I think uh, the focus on the abuse really overshadows uh, what the department and specifically what the Army has been doing uh, over the last couple of years, uh, even before uh, we saw those photos uh, at Abu Ghraib. And, and when you take a look at the, the period from April uh, to December of 04, and, and you look at the incidence of reported abuse, there's a decrease of over 80 percent. And you might ask yourself, what, what, what contributed to that, that decrease? And uh, Matthew uh, Waxman indicated a few changes that have taken place uh, in, in policy, doctrine, and training, and I'd just like to take a second now just to highlight a couple of those that, that the Army has undertaken. Uh, first of all, we're, we're clarifying policy, uh, specifically the policy as it pertains to the role of the uh, military police uh, uh, soldier in, in, in military intelligence. Uh, our policy uh, is, is, is spelled out in uh, Army Regulation 190-8. Uh, that regulation is, is under revision, and it clearly specifies as the role of military police. Uh, military police do not actively participate in interrogations. Uh, the current or the old 190-8 uh, did, did not spell that out very specifically, so we wanted to certainly clarify that. So we're clarifying policy. We also clarified, uh, for example, uh, the reporting timeline for any ICRC reports. And also, uh, we've clarified command and control, so we, we think that's very important. Also, we've trained over 16,000 soldiers. Uh, we've done this to developing some training support uh, plans and packages. Uh, we've used mobile training teams that have gone out across uh, our, our Army and, and trained all components. Uh, we've embedded within our basic training environment our non-commissioned officer education system and professional military education system the lessons that we're learning uh, on a daily basis that, that we've uncovered through a detailed review and analysis of the ten reports that have just been mentioned. And, and more importantly, uh, within all of these uh, uh, training environments, we're really stressing uh, five core uh, basic functions, values, ethics, uh, leadership, the law of war in Geneva Convention. Uh, we're expanding doctrine from two publications to eight. Now, we're not doing that because of the abuse. We're doing that because our soldiers have found themselves in a very challenging and new environment. And as a result of that, we've needed to expand doctrine to take into consideration, for example, uh, how our enemy uh, is adapting to our techniques, tactics, and procedures. And another significant uh, change that has taken place, and this change started well before Abu Ghraib, was uh, the initiative to add additional military police force structure to the active component inventory. And, and I'm happy today to, uh, to, to, to indicate that there's over 35 military police units uh, that will uh, be added to the uh, force structure uh, between now and 08. And this will certainly uh, help uh, the Army continue to provide the combatant commander with trained and ready soldiers. Uh, another significant fact that I believe that led to a significant decrease in reported abuse is the fact that we've decreased 
to de the guard to detainee ratio. At Abu Ghraib, it was uh, approximately 1 to 75, and now today it's 1 to 8. That's a significant improvement. Uh, and as Matthew indicated, uh, there's a well-documented now institutionalized process uh, within the Army uh, to review in a very comprehensive manner all the findings and recommendations in this report. And for the Army, that equated out to about 200 actionable tasks uh, that we work on a daily basis to implement short- and long-term solutions. Uh, we do this in concert, of course, with our counterparts on the Joint Staff and OSD, uh, and, and we believe uh, we've made significant progress and we continue to do so. We remain focused. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Gandy. I'm the Army G2 uh, Director of Human. Human intelligence, human intelligence and interrogation as a subcomponent remain very critical aspects of our war on terrorism and our fights in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, even before Abu Ghraib began, we began a doctrinal scrub of our human, our interrogation training. And once the Abu Ghraib occurred, we kind of yanked back that scrub, took another relook at it, have gathered, as uh, Colonel Champagne has said, all the lessons learned from the many reports and studies and our own investigations, and uh, rewrap that doctrine. Uh, new FM is about ready to come out. The date uh, was, is, is certainly within the next month or two, uh, barring some editorial changes. And then that doctrine, you're going to see uh, the interrogation techniques closely uh, wrapped together with safeguards uh, in accordance with the Geneva Convention. So we found in, our, in some of our studies and some of our findings that the interrogators knew the Geneva Conventions, they knew their interrogation techniques, but they sometimes had trouble connecting the two. So we've taken a very active step to make sure that in the technique A, there's a Geneva Convention safeguards are trained right side by side with that. In the same vein, we're also going to develop and put into uh, uh, annex to this information uh, left and right boundaries for each interrogation technique. So the interrogators have very specific guidance on which techniques they can and can't use and how, in the context they can use them. So the uh, probability or the possibility of those, ever, those folks ever stepping over the line, it will be very, very narrow. Now, for those times when, when they get close to the line, we've also made significant improvements in the oversight of interrogations, enforcing a discipline of interrogation planning, uh, oversight, uh, monitoring of interrogations, uh, you may recall from some reports a chain of command wasn't as active as it should have been. We've made corrections within the chain of command to ensure leaders are involved in the interrogations uh, beginning to end. Uh, and we've improved all those, those oversight techniques. As uh, Colonel Champagne uh, mentioned earlier, we've also uh, improved training quite a bit. Not just soldier training on interrogation, but also uh, leader training for non-commissioned officers and officers. Leader training at the senior level, so the senior officers understand their responsibilities in terms of uh, oversight of interrogations. And uh, we've conducted this training, as Colonel Cham Champagne also said, at the schoolhouse, at uh, places where units prepare for deployment, and even overseas. We have what we call mobile training teams, and we send them out to places where interrogations are being conducted uh, to see, to check, to see how the training's taking, what lessons there are occurring, are taking place, and which ones aren't, and to make a, take immediate action to fix any d discrepancies or shortfalls they see in training. So we've taken a whole lot of, a lot of steps. Uh, another portion of our oversight is to make sure that the doctrine in, we find at the joint level, the doctrine that we find at uh, the Army level is one and the same. The words are the same. Uh, the procedures are the same. They're very well synchronized. So an, an interrogator or a leader implementing interrogation facility uh, will look at one doctrine and the other, and it'll be as identical as possible uh, with respect to, well, the only difference is being the echelon of the doctrine. The joint doctrine might be in a joint environment, the Army doctrine in an Army environment, but by and large, they're identical processes and procedures for conducting interrogations. We've also clearly defined, and we're training, uh, the role of interrogators with respect to the military policemen. Uh, they're both key components of effective interrogation operations, and they must work together, and yet they can't, they can't assume each other's functions. And, and we've worked very closely with the military police school, the military intelligence school, to make sure each discipline understands their lanes, their responsibilities, and they're each in each other's rules. We've instantiated in the interrogators the need to report violations when they see it, and we've trained them on how to do that in multiple different paths, so that if one path appears to be blocked to a soldier who uh, he, he may have seen something he's uncomfortable with, that there are plenty of other paths for the interrogator to report what they believe to be uh, improper techniques being used. 
We've also trained people and uh, established procedures and uh, policies with respect to the uh, other government agencies operating within detention facilities. So the bottom line is other government agencies will follow DOD policies and procedures while in DOD facilities. And that includes the observation of the interrogations, the interrogation planning, and everything else. And the other, government, other governmental agencies have agreed uh, with this policies, these policies also. Thanks very much. How does this work, uh, left to right, front? Have you um, have you shown this report to Secretary Rumsfeld and or have you briefed him? And as an Inspector General, you get complaints about conflict of interest from time to time. You are subordinate to the Secretary of Defense. Isn't there that possibility that somebody could come up or wouldn't you be in an extremely uncomfortable position if you found evidence that actually uh, did question some of the policies emanating from the Secretary's office? Uh, to the first question, I briefed Secretary Rumsfeld on, on my findings, uh, so I have done that. Uh, secondly, I think the reason I was picked uh, to do this uh, was because I was an Inspector General and because they wanted an independent look. Uh, I clearly got that sense from, from the Secretary that that's what he wanted, an independent look at how all this transpired. And to your premise that that put me in a conflicting position, uh, the answer is no. Uh, whatever I found, I found the facts were the facts. Uh, you might, and some people will, particularly those who haven't read the uh, investigation, might uh, <clears throat> uh, question the conclusions, but uh, what I found, uh, I reported. And would you all stress how valuable human or human intelligence is? Uh, and yet we know that uh, based on uh, the adversaries and uh, uh, some of the mindset of the people that you've taken as detainees, uh, that is perhaps uh, the most difficult situation in our history. Uh, how do you manage to do this without crossing the line? How can you get information from these people who apparently are so unwilling to give anything at all? Well, that's that's the uh, <clears throat> that's the debate that we need to have. Is a number of other investigations have, have pointed out the direct questioning, you know, generally uh, is the best technique and is the one that often, as you build rapport, works the best. But to your point specifically. Uh, many of the adversary in the global war on terror are, are trained to resist our techniques. So this is what, this is, well, this is exactly what led us down the path, the military commanders and the leaders, to look at how we could uh, work within uh, uh, the limits of the law to get the actionable intelligence we needed uh, to prevent further casualty, which we've done to some extent. I want to defer to maybe Tom on that because you've asked a good question. That, well, that's a great question, and as, and as the Admiral said, that's a debate we, we must have. Uh, we authorize interrogators to use certain techniques uh, to certain limits, and when, when those techniques are unresponsive, then we tell them that they have to cease, and we have to, uh, we have to back off and go on to basically uh, better sources of information where the techniques do work. In some cases, for instance, the hardest core folks, only time and patience will tell. Uh, sometimes uh, not paying attention to people, not giving them, pre pressing them very hard, is uh, can can uh, can be valuable. And there there are some techniques without being abusive that you can use in a longer term setting uh, to to get people to cooperate. A couple. I mean, we're talking about uh, you know, wet boarding or. Oh no, 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 no! I'm, I'm talking about non-abusive techniques. I'm talking, for example, there there is a, there are examples of uh, some of these folks have uh, have egos, strong egos. And simply ignoring them uh, uh, will will make them want to talk, and part of this is is making them want to talk, uh, even on, about anything. In other cases, there there are stories, uh, and there are anecdotes where people who of uh, certain uh, uh, professions uh, appreciate discussions about their profession, uh, just non not not related to the war on terrorism or anything. But that opens up a, a point where interrogators can build rapport. Uh, and also uh, uh, establish a uh, kind of a carrot that says, hey, we can continue to discuss your profession, the technical aspects of it. Uh, but we know we need some cooperation in return. And there are ways you can, you can do that. Admiral, Admiral Trevor, the, uh, uh, the questioning before Capitol Hill today, you agreed with the statement that uh, your report exonerated the policy. Uh, but you also, in your report, found some failures. I think you called them missed opportunities. Uh, specifically, you said that there had been no uh, guidance for interrogation techniques promulgated for Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, either to or by the U.S. Central Command. 
and that there was no field level guidance for the interaction of the DOD and other government agency personnel. Who's responsible for those failures and missed opportunities, and is are they going to be held accountable? Let me, let me go back to your 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 first premise, which that we had exonerated policy. I'm not, I'm, I don't remember that, but I, that may have so, words so were said. The uh, Washington Post and, and read the headline and okay. asked you whether you agreed with it, and you said you, that the policy. I think your response was the policy did not contribute to the abuse. Thank you, because that's what I was uh, exonerate, exonerating. Is never a word that I used. And, and what we found, what the facts of the investigation found, were that as you looked at, and this is critically important, as you looked at, analyzed all 70 of the completed in, investigations, there was nothing in there. Any of them that talked any that used that referenced any interrogation techniques whatsoever, which drove us to the to the conclusion. Now, to your second question, uh, missed opportunities. Missed opportunities. I think probably you can equate to lessons learned. These are things that had something been in, you know, perfect hindsight, had something been done differently, then there may have been a different outcome. But I don't think you can, you know, hold anybody accountable for a situation that, that maybe if you'd done something different, maybe something that would have uh, occurred differently. It's a lesson learned that we need to capture and think about for the future. Well, uh, but when you say, when you find that they didn't give guidance for how to interact with uh, other government agency personnel, and then, then as you testified today, that results in somebody falling through the cracks. Isn't that a failure, and shouldn't someone be held accountable for that? Isn't someone responsible? That that uh, I don't remember specifically. That was a, uh, a a missed opportunity. We did that was one of the findings that there was no that there was no guidance issued to the field that uh, that how you would operate that. But I don't know. Uh, I, I you know. I don't know who you would assign responsibility necessarily to to do that. I think. Uh, a previous, I didn't look at Abu Ghraib, so let's be clear. I, I leveraged the other investigations. Um, the, the primary investigation in Abu Ghraib was, was General Fay. And uh, Tom, you can answer that because they specifically addressed that issue that, that somebody should have done that. But, sir, with, with all due respect, it, what it sounds like you're saying is that bad things happen, but no person or policy is responsible. No, I'm saying that bad things happen, and people are, 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 are you know, there's follow-up uh, uh, criminal investigation of misconduct where abuses happen. Then you, you know, you start looking at where where policy is somewhat deficient, or it, with perfect hindsight, you know, had we had we known that ghost detainees, as we say, was going to happen, had could somebody have maybe thought about that and issued a policy? I think you start going down a, a you know, a road. Responsibility on anyone. You, you, use, Never, this, you use this phrase missed opportunities. Why don't you just say there was a failure? Why don't you just say it straight out as a failure and, and assign responsibility like the Schlesinger panel did? I mean, well, why, I as, mean, you, as you know, Eric, we, uh, we, we were worked hand in glove with the Schlesinger panel. In fact, we reviewed their uh, report. All their data came from, from our database. And I've said uh, a couple times that uh, we concurred with the findings of, of, the, uh, of the Schlesinger panel. And they were very clear on on, uh, on responsibility. Let's go back to the, what, what was the tasking here. A lot of people would like this report, you know, this investigation to be a lot of things that it wasn't. It was to document and catalog all the interrogation techniques, the migration, what was used, what wasn't used, and the pay, the report's 378 pages long, and it does that. And we expanded that. Uh, I think the areas of responsibility are, are you know. You know, well covered. But you, you know, when you get in, you get into the next step. Well, you know, could we have been looking back have none issued guidance? I thought I was clear in my report. I said, you know, with with hindsight, uh, I think guidance uh, it should have been issued to Afghanistan and Iraq either by the central commander or or higher authority. That's the same thing that the Schlesinger panel found. So uh, I'm not in, you know, I'm in concert with that. I just made a reference to ghost detainees. The ACLU says uh, on the documents that they've recently gotten um, suggests there was a memorandum of understanding between the Army and the CIA about um, how they would handle ghost detainees. Was there such a memorandum of understanding? I don't believe. I, I have no knowledge of that memorandum. No. no. There was not? <clears throat> I mean, you, you did find that there were ghost detainees. 
Yeah, the, uh, as I uh, say in the report, and then maybe in the unclassified summary, I can't remember, uh, the CIA actually uh, worked with us on that and cooperated with us. And between the two of us, we figured there were about 30 detainees, I think the longest one for a period of about 45 days. You needed to elaborate, Tom. Just, uh, just real quick, I, I was uh, served as uh, General Faye's uh, deputy on the Faye report investigation and one of our findings was uh, and this is after exhaustive research not as not as much as perhaps as Admiral Church's research that there was that we could not find an agreement uh, with uh, MNFI uh, or the or the OGA and one of the fixes we that we have had put in place is to have a very specific policy uh, with uh, pertaining to the role of OGA inside the facilities and in hindsight 2020 to hindsight uh, knowing what we know now, we would like to have probably seen something like that before, but we couldn't find it. So the, the, the whatever the allegation that there was an agreement, I think is is not not true. At least in my my investigation, the investigation I did with General Fay. You've been very patient. Uh, uh, what do you say uh, to <coughs> human rights groups who are today calling your report a whitewash, and are asking for uh, an independent investigation into the detainee abuse issue? Well, first of all, no one's read my report, so uh, I would I would challenge you. I, I expect to be challenged on the conclusions of the report, and I've already talked about responsibility, which was, was done by the Schlesinger panel. But uh, after 800 interviews, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, 800 interviews, several thousand pages of, of documents that we reviewed over nine months, uh, many undersworn, uh, uh, many were sworn to. Uh, interviews with all of the seniors, Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Vice Chairman. Uh, no one, uh, I don't believe anybody can call this a whitewash. Uh, the facts are what the facts are. I was an independent uh, in, uh, in investigator, an IG. Uh, I took that very seriously. Uh, I've answered that question already that had the uh, facts in the uh, uh, documentation led me to a different conclusion I would have made that conclusion so my sense is that anybody is unhappy with the report and I'm very sorry to see anybody use that word is unhappy with the findings so that's that's my personal view and maybe that's what you were looking for yes sir I'll continue. Admiral, um, as the principal author of this report I'd like <coughs> to ask your opinion you've referenced the fact that the, the actual report is several hundred pages long in your opinion is there any reason, if the classified parts were removed, that it could not be released in full and, and not endanger national security? Because the Pentagon said it's not going to be released. Let me refer to somebody who understands the uh, uh, DOD policy. Uh, aside from DOD policy, I want to know your opinion as a person who wrote the report. Is there anything in it? Is there any reason it couldn't be, couldn't be reported, uh, uh, released? I'm not saying whether it should. I, that's another question. But could it be without damaging national security? It would have to be uh, heavily redacted, in, in my view. Most of and it is classified. Without okay, you redact the classified materials; it could be released. I, I, w I would have no. Uh, I don't. I think that would be fine. Sure. sure. Please. Um, uh, two questions. In your report, uh, you talk. You, you mentioned that in January, General Casey tightened or changed the rules of interrogation. Could you elaborate on that for us, please, and tell us how they've changed since the last round of interrogation guidelines that we've seen? And also, just a numbers question: um, When you broke down the serious and the um, and the not so serious abuses, how many of those abuses are covered in the Abu Ghraib scandal, and how many are outside? I don't know how you count up the, those incidences. Well, we, we we try to walk through it in the in the larger report because General Fay had 44, and they didn't cross necessarily to the what the criminal investigation uh, piece was doing. In, in the 70 that were completed, most of Abu Ghraib was st were still open cases as of 30 September. So, so as we report these 70, we should say that most of the Abu Ghraib cases are not included in that? I think there may have been a, a, a couple investigations completed. Of course, the, the follow-on uh, uh, legal proceedings hadn't uh, accomplished, but I think a couple of them were, but I can't remember exactly. And, the, and General Casey's new interrogation? Uh, you know, that, that happened in January uh, after we were in actually final draft. Tom, can you talk? Uh, I know generally, and I read it real quickly one time that, you know, he, as I understand it, he went back pretty much towards doctrine and uh, tightened up some uh, ambiguities that he felt may may be lingering from the prior guidance. But 
I, th I think you need to ask General Casey or maybe uh, Tom, you might know. I think but he is. Thank you. Uh, Sir. Will you say that you only got help from the CIA with respect to Iraq? Why did they not give you information on Afghanistan and Guantanamo? Well, <clears throat> the, what I was tasked to do was to, to look at how DOD interfaced with the uh, uh, OGA, which is primarily CIA. That happens in two places. It happens at, at, at Gitmo. And we're, we're, we know what goes on there, and we had good documentation. But th it also happens that, uh, in Iraq where we have a lot of uh, interface, and DOD provides much, much of the logistical support to, to the CIA in Iraq. And, and at the time, we were also looking very closely at the issue of ghost detainees. In Afghanistan, uh, Bagram and uh, Kandahar, the two in, internment sites, are uh, strictly DOD run. And, in the, uh, in the CIA uh, uh, has independent operations in Afghanistan. So, please. Admiral, um, talking about how thorough the investigation was, you were basically done in December when the reports came out of FBI agents mm -hmm. reporting that they saw abusive conduct in Guantanamo. So how thoroughly did you look into those reports that came out of that FOIA case in December? Because there were a number of FBI agents, and, and I think you said this morning, you talked to some of the investigators in that, but not the agents themselves? We had a, uh, a memo that I think you've seen a dated July of last year that, that is the basis for, for most of the emails that talked about three incidents. And we were quickly able to correlate two. One, uh, CID had initiated an investigation on. Uh, subsequent to the completion of our report, as you, you said, there were additional allegations in the, in the, the FOIA uh, documents, which, of course, we didn't have access to. So the Southern Command is, is now looked at, looking into that. The current Naval Inspector General is, is looking at all the uh, FOIA FBI uh, documents. Last Friday, I had uh, General Furlow in and the Naval IG in to ask them, you know, where they were and learned that the Naval IG, for example, has looked at 16,000 documents so far. They both told me that, that so far, not to prejudge the, the outcome of the investigation, and maybe I shouldn't even go this far, that it all, there's no new information at all relates to the eight incidents uh, that we already knew and have been previously reported at Guantanamo. But that said, the, they're both open investigations, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't go any more. Yes, ma'am. One of the criticisms uh, that you heard this morning in Congress was that they were saying that the issue of personal accountability hasn't been addressed. And I believe the Schlesinger report said it was out of their scope. It sounds like it's out of your scope as well of this study. Um, do you know when it might be addressed? Um, you, said, you mentioned that there were future studies that were coming down the pipe. There's a distinction, uh, those of us serve in uniform, between responsibility and accountability. Uh, there's there's a lot of responsibility that uh, is clearly articulated in the Schlesinger report. The issue of accountability follows that determination. The Army, as I understand it, is the Army Inspector General is looking at a lot of the uh, uh, the conduct of a number of the uh, uh, senior Army officials that, uh, uh, with respect to any accountability and. And I don't want to prejudge that. Uh, I've seen the list. It's a couple pages long. So I think that's coming. Yeah, along those lines, a year into this, are you surprised that nobody along those lines has been charged at the brigade, battalion level, uh, even up to Sanchez? <laughs> uh, you're asking me for an, op an opinion. Uh, <clears throat> it's not that, you know, action isn't ongoing. There, there's legal processes sometimes, you know, take, take a while. Um, so, I mean, I just know that, you know, it's, it's proceeding. Eric? Talk for about two more. Okay. Thanks. I got Eric. I got you. Let me get the gentleman behind you. Uh, in, in August of 2003, you said Captain Carolyn Wood submitted her draft policy to uh, CJTF-7. Did uh, General Sanchez see that? Did you ask him if he saw that? General San Sanchez signed out the September memorandum on, on which that was based. I don't believe he actually saw that, but he saw that that was one of the inputs into the, the, the list of techniques that he approved in September. His staff said that that was posted on the wall with his logo because Carlin Wood had got his logo somehow. Did you sure. ask him about that? Uh, no, but I asked him a lot of questions, but uh, I don't, I believe he, 
I'm trying to remember, and I'm not evading the question. I just can't remember if I specifically asked him that question. I, either in my investigation or previous investigation, I believe he said that he had never seen that. Uh, but, but you know, I, you need to make a good point because those those uh, techniques came from Afghanistan. It's important to remember that uh, they were each and every one of those reviewed with uh, with a Geneva lens before General Sanchez signed those out. There's a question over here that General, I haven't why mentioned. Why didn't you talk with Secretary Rumsfeld and Chairman Myers for your report? You mentioned you stopped short at Secretary Wolfowitzen. The Vice Chairman, after all, this is a report looking at policies and procedures. Why not talk all the way to the top? Uh, two reasons. I had, uh, I, as I was working my way through unanswered questions, I progressively asked questions uh, up the chain of command. Uh, and I did uh, need to have some clarification from Dep Sec Dev Wolfowitz and, uh, and the Vice Chairman, uh, General Pace. Uh, by that point, I had uh, resolved the issues that I needed to have resolved. But it's important, uh, and the Secretary of Defense told me this, that, that had I needed access to interview him, uh, that access was uh, was granted. Uh, I just had no more questions. That uh, having reviewed the thousands and thousands of documents and the other interviews, I I really had no need to the, to go any further. But you, but the opportunity was there. So. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> Thank you. I kept hoping you'd ask this question to one of these other folks. <laughs> well, we like David a little. <laughs> the quad doesn't show. I used to tell my quad I got rest of all my skippers and told them all that. Yeah, Senator Warner, I closed session, asked me if I wanted to take this off. And I said, no, uh, this doesn't show any quads. So I think I won't. Very good. Thank you.